Welcome to the Stop Italian Sounding Podcast, uncovering authentic Italian food. I'm your host, Robert Campana, and join me as we delve into the rich heritage of genuine Italian food, exploring its legends, history, and traditions. Through important tips and insightful interviews with industry professionals, you'll gain a deeper understanding of authentic Italian food. Welcome back, everyone, to the Stop Italian Selling Show, uncovering authentic Italian food. So for today's episode, I'd like to briefly discuss the history of the introduction of Italian food to the United States. So Italian food in the U.S. is considered to be one of the most consumed and well-known cuisines. And one may ask the simple questions of why and how this has come to be true. So why do some people consider Italian food to be as, quote unquote, as American as apple pie? And I say it like this because you could literally find Italian food or Italian style food or Italian American food everywhere. And how did this happen? So I'd like to briefly discuss that for today's show. So, of course, when a group of people emigrate from one country to another, they tend to bring their own culture with them. And when referring to culture, typically language, food, and habits are the first things that come to mind. And according to the U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Census, Italians started to emigrate to the United States in the early 1800s. And believe it or not, this was actually before Italy was even a unified nation. In fact, to call them Italians would almost be incorrect. But since they came from the Italian peninsula, of course, known as Italy, uh, even before the unification, they were officially referred to as quote unquote Italians. So of course, arriving mainly from the southern part of Italy, these Italians were in search, obviously, of a better life, one far from poverty and misery, unfortunately, two words that could be used to describe their living situation in the south of Italy during the 19th century. So as the years progressed from the early 1800s to the later portion of the century, Italy finally became united from north to south. But the poor conditions of everyday life changed very little. In fact, it was stringent political situations and continued poverty that pushed mass immigration of Italians, which started to accelerate around the end of the 19th century. And with this, of course, the wave of Italian immigration to the United States brought a new culture, especially that of food. As Italian immigrants were coming mainly from the south of Italy, their culinary traditions were very strong and linked to their specific towns. As they usually were farmers with their main goal to survive with the food that they would grow, the animals that they would raise, and ultimately the food that they would be able to produce with the sources they had. Bartering, in fact, was a common practice as families would trade their crops and food for things that they couldn't produce at home. Traditional examples of this would be milk from the animals that would be turned into cheese, or tomatoes that would be turned into sauce, olives that would be turned into olive oil, and many other things like meats that would be aged over time and turned into prosciutto or salame. And with this, new culinary traditions were born, each different than the other. Despite being from the same country, Italians would eat food prepared in different ways, thus enriching the variety of what we call Italian food today. So their strong link to food has led some of them to open up restaurants, delis, food stores, and many communities around the quote-unquote new world. And the first thing that comes into mind during that time period in New York City is the Little Italy. This is how Italian cuisine started to become introduced to the United States through the culinary quote-unquote know-how brought to the U.S. that would come to be worth a multi-billion dollar industry in the future. And as the years passed, the immigration from Italy increased. Eventually, the First and Second World War broke out. And as the U.S. Army was deployed in Italy and, of course, in other European countries, they quickly had to adapt to the culture. And as in Italy's case, food was a big part of their culture, as most Italians were and still are very linked to their culinary habits. So American soldiers in Italy had no choice but to adapt to the Italian cuisine. And upon their return to the U.S., the soldiers brought their desire for Italian food. So, quote unquote, Italian food products started to be produced in the U.S. by Italian artisans who had, of course, brought their knowledge and craving of Italian food to the new world. And these products, of course, were produced either for private consumption or to be sold and used in various Italian restaurants throughout the community. And all this started to happen since the arrival of Italian immigrants to the U.S. in the 19th century until a noticeable decline in the 1970s. And between these two time periods of mass Italian immigration to the United States, there was the introduction of the modern regulatory functions of what we know today in the U.S. called the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, and that happened in 1903. So according to the FDA, part of their mission is to obviously ensure the quote-unquote safety of the food supply here in the United States. Of course, the food regulations of the FDA in 1903 are not what they are now, and there have been many changes throughout the years to ensure what they consider the safety of food that is to be consumed in the U.S. 
This, of course, had major impacts on the way traditional food products were prepared and legally sold to the public. Certain requirements of specific ways for, of example, cheese preparation were put into place. And these requirements were put into place if the cheese was to be produced on a large scale and sold to the general public through different means, such as markets or restaurants. Examples can range from what type of milk is allowed to be used, how the animals are legally able to be raised in order to produce the milk, and certain ways cheeses are allowed to be aged over time. Now, there are big food companies in the U.S., many of which have owners or founders that came from Italy, bringing their specific quote-unquote know-how with them. Of course, they were able to successfully create companies in the U.S. to produce what they call Italian products. We see a lot of cheeses to stick with the cheese example, such as mozzarella, ricotta, gorgonzola, romano, which is supposed to imitate the pecorino romano, and parmesan, which is supposed to imitate the parmigiano reggiano. But the main question is this. Can we call them Italian if they're produced outside of Italy using non-Italian raw materials? Putting Italian flags on packaging, using Italian words, or adding images of Italy does not make that product Italian. So to answer my own question, I would say no. They would be considered Italian style, obviously, or Italian sounding, or simply Italian American. And there's nothing wrong with that. Italian American cuisine and Italian cuisine are two separate things, both, of course, to be respected totally as they each have their own unique histories. So as we wrap up today's episode, I'd like to make this analogy that I heard from a good friend of mine. If I create a car, paint it red, and put a logo of a horse on it, does it make it a Ferrari? No, of course it doesn't. And the point that I'm trying to make is that, yes, Italian food was introduced to the U.S. through immigrants who brought it here. And like many cultural aspects from immigrant populations, they start to change over time, adapting to the local culture and food in this case is no different. Thank you for joining me on this journey through the stories of authentic Italian cuisine. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for more insights and interviews. Also, feel free to reach out with your thoughts or questions on our social media channels at Stop Italian Sounding or on our website, stopitasounding.com. Grazie a tutti e alla prossima.